inspirational interview from Ethan. He talks about some of the low points in his life regarding his close family and some of the big lessons he learned. Also, listen to the part that gave us both goosebumps and see if you get them as well when you listen to this story from Demo Day. Ethan talks about the hardest thing about running a startup. It may not be what you think and how he gets through some of those hard days. He also talks about what made a huge impact with company culture. That and much more. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Ethan Austin. He's co-founder of Give Forward. Give Forward helps people fundraise online to support a loved one with a medical crisis. Just a little bit about Give Forward. They've reached $50 million in funds raised for families around the country. Give Forward has visited more than 1.5 million times per month. They have close to 1 million people who have donated to a friend or loved one in need. And I always like to include a fun fact about the guest. Fun fact about Ethan is he loves burritos. He's eaten a 2.5 pound burrito, which was double everything, triple the meat. And he once hired an intern because she claimed to have eaten a seven pound burrito. So Ethan's going to talk to us about, I mean, many of us talk about how we have things stopping us in life, anything from personal issues, money, health. The question is, how do we overcome what sometimes seems to be insurmountable obstacles? So Ethan's a perfect person to tell us about how to overcome some personal and business challenges. Ethan, what was some of the, first of all, welcome. Thank you. What was one of the low points, one of those emotional low points in the past that you had to overcome? I think for me, the, the biggest one, uh, well, my grandma just passed away recently. And oh, sorry to hear that. That was, that was a low point. I was very close to, to her, but... But the biggest one for me was uh, as a kid, when I was 13 years old, my father passed away, um, which is difficult for, for any kid, as you can imagine. So, so that has to be the biggest one for me. So what do you do at that time when something like that happens? How do you respond to that? I think you just keep on living. I don't think there's anything you can do um, besides just keep, keep going on and, and knowing that, uh, you know, you're your father is always with you and in spirit and, and taking positive things from that. So for me, uh, the lesson I really learned from that uh, is that life is short right? and that you have to do what you want to do in life. You have to go out and explore and not settle for you know, the average path and really make what you have of this time on earth because you ha- your time could be short. Um, so that's one thing that I think I really learned from that is never to really settle and, and always keep pushing forward. I mean, I, I see that. It sounds like, though, at the time, were you thinking the same thing? Because it's like that's a really tough thing to go through. Were you, did I you? Yeah. I don't know if at the time I was thinking that. I think it took me, it took me years later to kind of figure that one out. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it took me passing up on an opportunity after college to kind of put those two together. Um, but it makes you, you know, it makes you think about those things. You don't stop thinking about, you know, like your dad, like every day of your life after that. Words, right. and, and you, you know, it makes it kind of crystallizes things for you. Right. So you realize life was short. So what were some of the things that you've done because you you made that realization and and learned that lesson? I mean, I think, I think anything in life, I, I mean, from deciding to go to college out of state, you know, when I was in high school and thinking, I'm going to be in California the rest of my life, I'm going to do something different, um, and not being afraid to make decisions um, based, on, based on that realization. I think, again, just, you don't know how long you have here, you really need to make the most of it while you're, while you're here, and... Um, just keep pushing forward as much as possible. So anything from going to college out of state, thinking I was going to come back and feel, you know, go go off to Panama after college to start a hostel, uh, and then just doing doing those types of things that that really, um, you know, may not be typical, but something I believed in and wanted to do for myself. I guess you know I asked for the audience, but I asked for myself too. Like I know that that life is short and I need to do something. But the same respect, I find myself, you know, working long hours or like knowing like, 
at what point, how do you balance the, I guess, the long-term goals that you have or long-term things you want to accomplish to, like, right now I should be out, like, at a beach sipping and relaxing you know, with family, you know? Like, how do you balance that? You, you don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think you know what I mean? Like, I totally know what you mean. And, um, I, I, you know, I think a lot of people struggle with that, and it's like trying to find more hours in the day to prioritize the important things, right? The things that matter the most, family, friends, enjoying life with finding purpose in your life. Um, and those two things are often at odds uh, because finding purpose often means you're you know, working those incredibly long hours and ignoring those relationships that, that you cherish so much. So I, I don't have a, an answer to that one, and I think maybe part of it is, is doing things in cycles like going really hard um, at work for a while and then for a period focusing on family and then a period focusing on friends. But I don't think anyone, if someone knows the answer to that one, please please email me uh, because I'd like to know myself. Well, one thing I do notice about you, though, is, you know, with what you do, whatever it is, whether it's work or, or whatever, fun, is you just have a passion for it. So... Um, tell us, tell me about some of the the early days of either volunteering or when you started Give Forward, because you obviously have a huge passion uh, for this. Yeah, so you mean volunteering for like nonprofit organizations or? Yeah. Sure. So I mean, I'd always been involved with cancer organizations because of my dad, um, I and mean, even in high school, started volunteering for a group called Kids Connected. Then. In college, volunteered, and then after college, um, when I was in, I didn't volunteer that much when I was in law school. I skipped about three years of volunteering. And I think I was just had my nose in books, but then uh, started volunteering for a group called Immerman Angels when I when I after college when I was in uh, after law school in Chicago and uh, started raising money for them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just always been a something I've cared about. Uh, I think it's easy when it's meaningful to you and and um, I don't know, I've always found a lot of a pleasure in, in being able to help others uh, through these types of organizations. Yeah, I mean, so going through, you know, obviously that low point, what's what's one of a proud moment that you have that you, you think on? From from just uh, from give forward, I know that you were talking sure. about um, one point. You mentioned demo day. Oh, uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, so we went through a program called Accelerate Labs, and we had worked. We had bootstrapped for about two years, um, and really had very low rent, and we were working side jobs to make ends meet. And the business wasn't really going anywhere for two years. And finally, we got into this program called Accelerate Labs, uh, which is now Techstars Chicago. It's a, like an accelerator program. And we got really lucky just to get into the program. Um, there was hundreds of companies that applied, and they accepted 10 of them. And somehow we got into it. Um, and we had the end of the program. It culminates with a big demo day. It was at the House of Blues with 500 investors, and we were the first company uh, to go through the program, or the first class to go through the program. And uh, on demo day, we were supposed to be the first company to present, and so we were going to be the first class and the first company. And for the last month of the program, all we did was work on this demo, this pitch. We went over it probably a hundred times. Uh, Probably 500 times. I only said 100. That's that's probably underestimates how many times we went over. We probably edited it. And had 100 different versions alone. Um, and the day before demo day, my partner Desiree was supposed to present it, and they almost took her out because they weren't sure if she was going to really knock it out of the park. And when it came to demo day, we had someone introduce us, and the woman who introduced us got up on stage. And it was someone who had used Give Forward, mm. whose sister had raised money on Give Forward, and she'd raised thirty thousand dollars for this woman to get a kidney transplant um, that that she wasn't wasn't able to get otherwise. And the woman she got up on stage and she says, "I'd like to introduce Give Forward 
um, I'm here today, I'm alive today because of them. And then she got off stage and and then Desiree gave the presentation and just knocked it out of the park entirely and everyone in the whole place had goosebumps. And I just got goosebumps when you yeah, said no, that. It was it was it was pretty wild and and the very first presentation to go and the, the very first class and the very first thing that happens is this this young woman says, I'm here today because Give Forward saved my life. And that was a, a very proud moment for us. Oh, that is amazing. So who are some of the mentors that you had that has, have helped you? What kind of advice have they given you? Sure. Um, I had two. I'd say one mentor is not someone that we see all the time, but someone um, who re we read all, all his books and from time to time is nice enough to give us a little uh, bit of advice via email. Seth Godin has been a tremendous uh, mentor, I think, and not in, like I said, not in that traditional sense of, a, you know, having that one-on-one -on -one relationship, but just some of the advice he's written and some of the things he's said to us um, has just been tremendous. And then on a one-on-one on -on -one basis, um, a guy named Tim Krauskopf, who was one of our very first mentors in the Accelerate program, really took us under his wing and believed in us when, when not, you know, when not everyone did believe in us, that it was pretty early at that stage, and really thought we were going to do some big things. And one thing that he said to us that, that's always stuck with me, um, and I am a firm believer of, he said, you know, when things are good, don't give yourself too much of a pat on the back, and when things are bad, you know, don't blame yourself too much for them. And to me, you know, what that says is, is that a lot of this, what we're doing, is luck, right? And you can work as hard as you want, and you have to work absolutely hard. It's, it's a prerequisite to success, is working hard. But no matter how hard you work, no one really gets there without the help of others. No one gets there without getting a little bit lucky. And I think once you know that, there's, that luck plays a large part in this equation, that it makes you both more self-confident and humble at the same time. Yeah, it's hard to do. What was a time that was good that you thought on those remarks and you're like, okay, I just need to forge ahead and not uh, get a big head or not pat myself on the back too much? Do you remember one of those? Because that also well, motivates like you, myself. right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think, um, you know, in the past couple of years, we've won a bunch of awards. We we won a, the best healthcare startup. We won the best startup in Chicago. We won an award that said we were the best, uh, I think, s social innovation in the country. Other winners were things like Apple for Siri and IBM for Watson wow. and SpaceX. And we were in this really elite crowd, and that yeah. seemed pretty cool. But at the same time, I mean, we realized every step of the way, it could have gone the other way. It could have, you know, just one misstep. And, and we, we could have been out of business a long time ago. Had we not ever got into Accelerate Labs, um, it was just by chance that we got in because one of the founders of Accelerate had experienced something similar to what, you know, what we offered. And he had had a friend of a friend of a friend who asked him to start a, a give for, or a, not a give forward page, start a fundraising page for someone who is sick. And had that not happened to him, we never would have got into that program. So. Um, so I think that was a moment when we were really proud of ourselves, but at the same time, know that it was just, you know, it's just a f very fortunate that we were even in this place. Yeah. So what about one of those bad times? Because it's also in those bad times, it's hard not to blame yourself too much or get down on yourself at that t at that point. What was one of those times? Um, I think our lowest point was about nine months in from when we launched. We launched in August 2008. About nine months in, when we first started, we were really a crowdfunding site for anything. And this is before crowdfunding was even a word. Back then they used to call it peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. It was before Kickstarter existed and kind of popularized the whole idea of crowdfunding. Um, and back then we were trying to do crowdfunding for anything. So you wanted to raise money for a scholarship fund. You wanted to raise money um, to for a nonprofit, you want to raise money for your, you know, to get a new dog. You want to raise money to have a party. Right. You want to raise money for anything. You could do it on our site. 
and we weren't seeing a ton of traction. Um, and the, actually, the, the, the traction was going in reverse. We started seeing um, our visitors start dwindling. And on January 1st, January 1st is always a bad day because everyone's hungover and no one's <laughs> on their computers. <laughs> but this January 1st was a particularly bad day. Uh, we actually had one visitor on the site that day. And I think that was, for us, at least for me, that was the low point when I thought, you know, I had just gone, packed up a couple suitcases and moved across country from California to Chicago to help start this. And, and, and I was really starting to question, I was like, was this the right idea at, at that point? And um, it turned out to be uh, the right idea. We just had to stick stick with it. But for sure, that was a, a low point that tested our conviction. How did, so how did you discover, obviously, you know, you were, that makes sense. Like people want to fundraise for a number of different reasons. How did you discover to, because I noticed it's real specific on the site for medical crisis. How did you discover just to go with that one thing? Because it's also hard to do. Yeah, um, it was a number of signs for us. So for us, the first sign was this surgeon in Texas. And at the time, the most anyone had ever raised on the site for a single fundraiser was about $2,500. Um, and the surgeon in Texas was running a marathon, and he had run many marathons, but he wrote that um, he never found a cause that he really wanted to run for until his pastor at his church uh, had cancer, and he said, I want to raise money for my friend with cancer. And he did that, and he raised $7,500 on a site which five years ago or four and a half years ago was horrible. <laughs> it was just an awful site to use. The fact that anyone was able to raise any money was impressive. And so he tripled the amount that anyone had ever raised on the site. Wow, yeah. Then the next thing was um, an instance where I was raising money for, for my buddy's daughter, and my buddy his fiance had just passed away from cancer and I was raising money for um, a scholarship fund for his 18 month old daughter and I was running along the beach uh, or the, the boardwalk in, in Venice, California and I had a, was uh, raising money, I was doing a, mar a half marathon the next day and I was a f about $13 short from my goal and I was just trying to raise the last $13 and I used to run around in a, in a banana costume to make people smile and laugh. And I promised if I hit my goal, I'd run the race in the banana costume. And I'd hand out flyers to people on the street. And, and people would donate um, just because, you know, sometimes they got a kick out of it. Sometimes they, they donate because they like the story. Mm -hmm. um, and so this guy, I saw him from about you know, 50 yards away, and he was just smiling. And I handed him a flyer telling him about the story of, of my friend's daughter and, and what happened. And it was for a scholarship fund. It wasn't directly for medical. Mm -hmm. But when I got back later after that run, uh, there was a, a $500 donation on my page from this stranger. And it was the, the biggest donation anyone had ever made on the site to that date. And to me, it just hit me because we had always thought, or at least I had always thought, that the biggest users of this site were going to be nonprofits. That this site would be about people raising money for the nonprofits they care about. And nonprofits would be our biggest clients. But that's for the very first time I think that's when it really hit me that it was about people giving to people. That something inside that guy connected when he read that story about the little girl that I was trying to help, my friend's daughter, mm -hmm. that maybe he knew someone who was in a similar situation. And that's when it just hit that like this site can be about people giving to people. Yeah. And so that was in December, uh, late December, I think. And then, um, and then a few months later, about three months later, um, was really the the big the big break for us that that made us really start to think that this is all about medical. Um, it was that 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 young woman I was telling you about who raised his sister raised $30,000 for her to get a kidney transplant and it helped save her life and they became we became so um, close to them 
Um, and we still talk to them this day, and we're friends with them this day. Um, but that experience of, of helping them and being able to be in a position to do that for them and the impact it had on their lives was really powerful and moving to us. And after that fundraiser happened, it got all this press in, in USA Today and the Tribune and all these places and more and more of those medical fundraisers. And it started off with um, kidney transplant fundraisers because that's what they were doing. And so more and more people started doing those. And as those rolled in, we were getting more and more thank you notes from people saying, hey, this is really important to us and this we don't know what we would have done without this site. Yeah. And so for us, it was it was just getting those emails and those letters from people. And we just said, wow, this is, this is powerful stuff. And maybe we should probably stop doing the other stuff. In the first year, uh, we hadn't been very successful anyway. And the first 12 months, we'd only raised about $6,000 in revenue. And so the other things we were doing weren't working. And on one hand, the, the fundraisers we were helping people do for medical expenses, well, they were, they were few and far between. Those people seemed to be very, very appreciative. Yeah. So it was about a year in when we, when we decided to kind of make that switch. So that was, a, that was a long answer, huh? No, I love that answer. <laughs> so what now for the audience listening? What's one thing that you'd recommend them to do right now to start overcoming their situation, whatever it is, their personal or, or business challenges? Yeah, um, I always say, and whether you, whatever you're doing, whether you're writing a book or starting a startup or um, you know making a movie, whatever it might be. I always say, you know, when people ask, what's the hardest thing about running a startup? And, and I always say the hardest thing about running a startup isn't running the startup. It's, it's having uh, the guts to, to get it started in the first place. And, um, you know, for a lot of people, I think that's what holds them back. Um, there's that saying that 80% of life is just showing up. And I totally believe that uh, because I don't think a lot of the people running things, I'm not the smartest person in the world and I don't think a lot of the people out that run things necessarily are that smart. I think they just did it and they decided to go after it um, and try it um, and maybe they were they were dumb enough to go try it and all the smart people um, are too scared to go try it. So I think the reality is there's not as much to lose as people think. Right? There's not really as much at risk as one might think, um, because if you go after something and you fail, you know you, you get back up and and you go back to your normal job or another job that's similar to what you had before. But I think um, that's the biggest thing. Uh, my my partner Desiree, she has a, a magnet on her fridge that says "Leap and the net will appear," and I remember when I joined her, she was starting Get Forward in Chicago and I was in California. And, and she was starting this business uh, with $25,000, most of which came on a Prosper loan, um, which like a crowdfunded loan. And she, the website was going to cost $40,000, and she had $25,000 without a business partner. She was non-technical and just decided, well, I'm going to start it and, and see what happens. And so she literally just leapt, and, you know, and then you know, the so-called net, the net appeared, in the sense that things turned out um, okay, but it wouldn't have happened if she had waited till all the right circumstances were, you know, in perfect, perfect place for her to be prepared. We we started in this horrible economy right in 2008 after the market uh, had crashed. It was just probably the worst time you could think to start something. Um, but I think the important thing was getting started. Yeah. So how do you show up, like? That day when you have one visitor, like how do you show up the next day? Like how do you get over that and like not just throw in the towel? Like obviously you, you're at that point you had started and you've been working hard at it. How did you get over that? I don't, I mean that day sucked. I'm not going right, to pretend. Right, that's what I mean. I'm not going to pretend that I felt cheery that day. Because you're working your butt off, right? And yeah. Yeah. I think it really... I don't want to say that day, but it was over time. We called them, we changed our metrics. 
instead of measuring revenue, well, we measured what we called hugs. And the hugs were those emails and letters and notes and sometimes videos people would send us that say this is important. Like we don't know what we'd have done for my brother if this didn't exist. Right? Like this saved someone's someone's life. And if that just came once or right. twice in an entire year, we thought to ourselves, holy smokes, like this is this important to that one person. Right. Imagine if we can actually get the word out about what this is, how important it will be to, to many people. Right. And so for us, we had this glimmer of light and, and, it, and it forced us to keep pushing on um, because we saw the impact it could have on one person. Right. Yeah, that's true. So people can just think of, they just have impact on that one person or one thing, it will make a difference. Um, so what's, what's a big milestone that you're able to achieve? After fighting through a lot of these challenges, life and, and business, what's a, uh, something you look back on that was a big milestone? I remember you talking something about um, a woman who wrote an article. Yeah. Um, so we had this woman write uh, for CNN a couple years back, and she named us, I don't know, I, I think top entrepreneurs to watch on CNN or something like that. And and we had stayed in touch with her. She was uh, this this writer, and she was you know this really nice nice woman. And um, we'd stayed in touch with her over the years. And unfortunately, uh, last year her mom was diagnosed with with cancer. And she wrote a blog post about it. And she called us up, and we um, told her how to get set up with the fundraising page, and gave her some tips on how to get started, um, some fundraising tips, and. Um, and she wrote a blog post later that says, said something along the lines of when, when my mom was first diagnosed with cancer, um, I didn't call up my brothers, I didn't call up the doctors, I didn't try and figure out what to do. The very first thing I did was I madly started emailing the folks at Give Forward. Um, and, and that, I think for us, our, our vision is that by the end of 2014, we want to be the first resource people think of when their loved one is sick or in medical crisis. And for us, that was the very first time that it felt like that vision was coming true. Yeah. That, that she did exactly what we were hoping to do, was that we will be that resource that people will think of first, that say, yes, of course I'm going to start a Give Forward page because that's what people do when their friends are sick, and that's how people help. And so for us, that was... That, that gave me goosebumps. That actually made me cry when, when I read that blog post from her. Yeah, that's amazing. What are some of the things you do in your everyday life or business, um, like systems that you use that uh, are helpful for you? <laughs> it's organized chaos. It's all, it's all chaos. Um, in terms of, so I live, like most of my day is either meetings or email. Um, it's one of those two. So, in terms of organizing email, um, I have a few tools I really like there. Um, one of them is called SaneBox, and it just eliminates all the stuff that's all the noise, right? You you get so many newsletters and, and junk mail and all this stuff that distracts you that even if you ignore it, you still spend time clicking on it. And what SaneBox does is it just eliminates all that so at the end of the day you get a summary of all those and if you want to look through them you can but it cuts through the noise and just sends you your important mail and which is great it cuts out about a, a quarter of your of your email um, so that's the one I really like uh, I also love boomerang for email which allows you to send stuff later or allows you to bring it back you know if you send something out to someone and they don't respond um, you can set a timer for it to come back to your inbox so you know to follow hmm. up. So it might be a day or a week or a month, or you can set any time you want. That one's really, really useful for me as well. Yeah. So what's – there is uh, early on when obviously, you know, people see what the site is and how successful it is now. Can you talk about maybe one one time of the scrappy days early on? Yeah. So the first couple of years we bootstrapped, we – we had zero. We spent that fifty thousand dollars on 
building the site, and then every penny we got um, that we earned in revenue went back into the site. So um, we didn't have a lot of extras. We spent seven hundred and fifty dollars a month on rent. Um, we used to cut our own business cards uh, using a paper cutter in our shared office, and we'd eat. That's great. I don't, I don't know if anyone else did, but I, I used to have my, my meals would consist of cereal in the morning, and then I'd, I'd make something called Linner, which was lunch plus dinner around 5 p.m. I'd get a Chipotle burrito, and the rest of my meals would consist of uh, the Werther's Originals that the office left out in the candy jar. So, um, you know, we were working multiple jobs. My partner, Desiree, was working as a waitress, and I was working uh, two jobs as, a, as a, a, a freelance writer to kind of make ends meet. But I think we just were cheap because we, you know, the longer we were in the game, and I think this is really true, is, you know, I think you, a lot of startups fail. Um, all startups fail because they run out of money. If you ask a VC, that's the only reason startups fail is they run out of money. So if you can hang in there long enough, you know, without a lot of money, without a lot of overhead, then you can hang in long enough to catch a lucky break. And so we hung around for two years before we caught our lucky break, which was Accelerate. Um, and, and I think that's, that was probably the key for us, is that we were just dumb enough to keep going. <laughs> or smart enough, yeah. Or smart enough, <laughs> whatever it is. Well, I have one last question for you, Ethan, and uh, but before I ask it, can you just tell us a little bit about Give Forward? Tell us what's exciting for uh, for the uh, site and the company now. Yeah, well, so we just hit uh, fifty million um, dollars raised on the site recently, it's amazing. Um, which is amazing when you think that last year at this time we were at about fifteen or sixteen million. Wow. And that was in the first four years. So in the in the last twelve months, we've doubled what it took us the first four years to do, um, which is really exciting. Just because it speaks to I think how much the marketplace has grown and how much um, people are accepting the idea of. Of course, I'm going to start a, a fundraiser for my friend when the, when they're sick. Um, so I think that has less to do with Give Forward than it has to do with the marketplace. But it's just a really exciting time. To be in crowdfunding, um, like I said, like, again, like I feel lucky in the sense that we started off really early, probably too early. But I say it's better to be early than to be late. We don't, want, you know, when we started off, there was five fund or crowdfunding platforms, and today there's well over 500. Um, but we were in early enough that we caught that wave um, of kind of that wave of success, and. Um, it's just kind of a fun time to be riding that wave and, and being part of uh, uh, this this trend that's really exciting and happening and being part of you know what's really what we're seeing just so much change in, in crowdfunding with things like Kickstarter just democratizing the entire arts community and things like Give Forward hopefully doing the same um, in medical in that medical space and creating a, a lot of good for people. I know a, an important part about the company too is culture. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so for us, it's. I think we, you know, I said we've grown. Um, you know, we doubled in the last year. What what took us more than four years to do before. Um, I think some of that has to do with with hiring, right? So I think culture for us is. It's three things. It's it's about hiring the right people, um, creating a culture. And, and culture isn't you know ping pong and, and beer. I think culture is really about values and giving people something to believe in, mm -hmm. um, giving people a reason to say, yeah, I want to I want to work here. I believe in this. I believe in this idea. Not I believe in crowdfunding pages, but I believe in the why the why behind we're doing it. Right? And like I believe in empowering compassion. So that's our our mission here at Give Forward, and um, really, what we we think about every day is this idea of creating unexpected joy for people, and everyone can get behind that. And so, for us, you know, it starts with bringing in the really smart people, because I admittedly um, 
I have no idea what what I'm doing and and um, and I think what we've seen is that with as we've brought in really smart people over the years, uh, our business has grown by leaps and bounds. So if you can bring in really great people, it creates this positive feedback loop between people and culture because people are attracted to great culture. They want purpose um, from what we've seen and 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 when you have that culture brings in those people and then great people bring in more great people um, which usually adds to your culture right it starts off as something you create and and gets better and better as you bring in more great people because they add to the culture and add their own twist to it so it creates this really awesome positive feedback loop so how do you create good culture like let's say someone doesn't have I mean yours you're, everything you're about is very inspirational and helping people with the medical crisis. What if someone has, you know, sells like pens or something? Like, how do they create a, a good culture? I think for us, it starts. Well, I'd read, I'd read the book Delivering Happiness. Um, my friend Johnny Emmerman, a couple years back, introduced me to the, that guy Tony Shea. Um, they were doing a tour event in Chicago, and I got the book and got to meet Tony Shea and, and read the book. and for two years, we didn't have values. We didn't have stated values. We had stuff that we believed in, but until you write it down, write down your values of what you believe in, I, my opinion is that they don't exist. And I remember reading in Tony Shea's book the same thing, that, that for years they didn't have any stated values. And, and once they turned, once they, once they created those values and, and wrote them down, it, it kind of turned things on, it flipped a switch for them. Mm. And we did the same thing, and, and I think it really made a huge impact for us because it, I mean, I know when, you, when you're talking to people and you can tell them this is what we believe in, people get excited because yeah. I don't think people get excited over things. They get excited over ideas. Yeah. Um, so no matter what you're doing, um, if, you know, if, you're, if you're selling pens, what is the reason you exist? Why, why are you selling pens? There's a deeper meaning uh, than just to sell more product. And so figure what, out what that is right. and, and tell people. Yeah, I love that. So definitely now I'm going to have to think, okay, for this site to go have like, go put a values page up on the site. <laughs> yeah. Now that you said that. <laughs> yeah, I definitely would. Um, so I have one last question for Ethan. I've been thinking about this the whole time we've been talking. I want to hear about your vision board. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, uh, I had a friend who invited me on New Year's Day to a vision board party. And I, I, didn't, I didn't really know what a vision board was. Um, and then I got there, and it was me and about 40 females. 40? And, uh, wow. It was, a lot of, it was a lot of women. There was a lot of estrogen bouncing off the walls. That That's a good ratio for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. Um, but uh, so we did these vision boards, and um, and I guess they're just like you cut out the things that you want to see happen to you that year, and kind of with you know it's the idea of having the end um, in mind, right? And starting starting with the end goal in mind, um, and just having that up on your board or your wall every day. You know you get a look at it every day, and it's just so I don't know if you call it a vision board or a visual to do list. But it just reminds you, these are the things I want to accomplish this year. These are the things that want, I want to happen. And in the end of the year, even if you don't look at it, you know, I didn't look at mine. I had mine packed away last year because I was traveling so much. And then at the end of the year, I looked at it, and, and a lot of the things off that list um, had happened. Right? So it was just kind of um, a neat tool. And I don't know if they, they'll work for everyone, but uh, I thought it was a, a pretty neat thing, and I've been doing it since. So what uh, what can you share with us that's on the vision board, or that um, you, that actually I, happened? Maybe that you're surprised about. Yeah, that one of them was um, a partnership with um, a big organization that we wanted to do a partnership with. Um, one of them was bringing on great people. Um, one of them was to go climb a mountain. Like some of them, so some of them are business, some of them were personal, um, and so those. What mountain those, did you climb? It was a it was a mountain called Table Mountain. I wouldn't say it was exactly Mount Everest. It was in South Africa. It was 
it was more of a strenuous hike, but it was called a mountain, so so I counted that. I'll as, count as it. My mountain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have you not do Mount Everest. That that sounds too dangerous. Yeah, maybe maybe in, maybe in the future. <laughs> Um, well, Ethan, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing your words of wisdom and, and some of the low points and high points with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.